people don't appreciate what they have. Mm. They usually appreciate what they lost. Yeah, well, they lost it in this. They, they lost a lot. Neo, they lost a lot of neoclassical. And I, I hope uh, Athenians wake up to the fact that these buildings are indeed very beautiful. The Bauhaus, the Pola Even the uh, Pola Because they're, yeah. wor they're worth preserving, in, in, exactly. my, in my opinion, at least. Yeah. Um, and the reason I say that is because I've been to so many cities and it's the same story over and over again. People are like, oh, this is ugly. Tear it down. We lost the beauty. Yeah. But I got the comment so many times that Athens is ugly, but yet beautiful. Yes. There are many little corners of beauty in Athens, because if you look at Athens yeah. from above, let's be honest, it's not a beautiful city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's a concrete monster. As you walk more throughout Athens, you'll notice that almost all the neighborhoods look the same. People can tell what the Acropolis is because it's the huge ancient building in the middle of the city. But as you go to different neighborhoods, Kipseli, Kukaki, Keremikos, Kolonaki, they all look the same because they're all surrounded with one type of architecture. And we see it right here. The multi-level housing that dominates Athens and Greece overall. The Greek word for this type of building is known as polykatechia. Oli, which translates into multi or many, and katechia, which translates to habitation or residence. Hence, multi-residence. Or as we say in American English, a condominium. The boom of 1800s neoclassical architecture was erased from the face of Athens. And then after the Greek Civil War of the 1940s, and especially the military junta of the 1960s and 70s, Athens had a massive construction boom. It grew so dense so quickly that it became nearly impossible to make any huge changes to Athens. Many people in this city hate it. Some people love it. It has its charms but also has its pitfalls. So I wonder, will Athens change for the better or does it have to change?
I've been trying to rack my brain as to how to describe the aesthetic of Athens because it's an ugly and yet beautiful city. It's beautiful because of its grittiness and its grunginess and its chaos. And many people said the same thing as we have interviewed many locals throughout the city. However, there's no eloquent way I can find of sharing that feeling of Athens. However, as I was wandering through the bookstores here in Kulunaki, I actually found this book, Walking in Athens. This man really gets to the heart of what is the soul of Athens. Nikos Vatopoulos is the true definition of an urbanist, which means an advocate for cities. But I think the meaning of urbanist goes deeper. It's a person who, through exploring the city, has developed a profound understanding for how it works and grows. That's why I called my own show Urbanist. I don't merely appreciate cities. I'm on a lifelong mission to learn how they tick, not just intellectually, but also experientially. For the past several decades, Nikos embodied the urbanist spirit. He roams the streets of Athens, noticing the small details that many overlook and the abandoned corners that few ever venture into. He works as a journalist for one of the leading newspapers of Greece, photographing and writing about the architecture and culture of Athens. A way to understand this city, which is not that easy to to comprehend at first sight, maybe. Right? right? Yeah, exactly. You agree? Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's not like... Uh, I'm getting close, but... Yes, it's not like Rome or Prague, <laughs> right. which is easy to decipher a little bit. Athens, there is this huge urban sprawl mm. that you see from the Acropolis, from the mountains to the sea, which is the ancient landscape of classical Athens, of course. Right. But in order to understand the contemporary city, maybe one would have to have in mind that there were huge population shifts from the 19th to the 21st century. Mm. And um, I would uh, designate three historic circles. In the early 1920s, yeah. after the greco turkish War, Asia Minor, which was in the aftermath of the First World War, when we have the defeat of the Greek army in Asia Minor. Mm. So there was a massive influx of Christian population from the ancient lands of Anatolia and Asia Minor coming to Athens and other parts of Greece. So we had a sudden, abrupt rise of population here. Gradually we have the assimilation of this Greek from Turkish lands into the old Greek society here. Athens starts getting a real metropolis in the 1920s. So it was the first chapter of its adulthood, let's say, as a metropolis. It took about 20 to 30 years to accommodate these people, because there was also the War of the Forties, and all this found Athens in the aftermath of the Civil War in 1949. So I had the influx of people coming from the countryside. That was a big second phase of uh, attracting people in uh, the capital. Was they the able 90s. to handle all that influx of people? Yes. yes. Gradually, okay. yes, with a lot of problems, mm. but yes, with foreign help as well. Oh. You have this devastated country, and you have all this post-war development. Actually, there was this Marshall Plan, uh, the American packet of money came to Europe to restart the economies, and the Greece, I think together with Germany, were the main receivers of this plan. So there were public projects, like big dams being built in the power company, the electric uh, electricity was coming everywhere. During the 50s and 60s, there was a huge development rate. Because of this prosperity and because of the need to house all these people from the countryside, there was a, a building boom. Actually, there were no big money operators, like uh, private operators. So there had to be some way to build housing for the people. The, the, the state itself was kind of poor in relation, let's say, to, to Italy or France, England or... So there were a lot of contractors, a lot of um, the public sector took over and uh, started uh, small 
constructed companies to demolish old houses and uh, deliver new apartments. Well, the government at that time did not opt for a heritage uh, approach because it was a different era, don't forget, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, people did not so, so much um, appreciate the early 20th century architecture. It was too recent. There was a very strong desire for the new, for modern amenities, for modern life. Oh, they associate with old and decrepit. Yes, yes, and the pre-war war world, but everyone wanted to forget. And of course, many of the old houses did not have a lot of, uh, let's say, good infrastructure. The bathrooms were very old. Um, it was people wanted a modern apartment, mm. hot water and uh, central heating. So yeah, the Barohi came up as a tool to monetize these lots of land that were available. Was money being exchanged? Yes, there was money being exchanged. And the, the people who were making money, but they were working in the, the, the power company. So they didn't have the money to, let's say, build a polykatechia, but they did have just, just the money to buy an apartment. So the, this um, anti-parochy system uh, gave them the means to build the whole polykatechia with small packets of money coming from different to-be buyers. It was a wise system, of course, because you could have a, a new apartment building with no capital. You have an old house, the contractor came to you and he asked you to give him his house. You would get two or three apartments and he could uh, fuel his uh, investment by pre-selling the apartment. Mm -hmm. So people would pre-buy the apartment before the building would uh, finish. You would wait for one or two years for the building to be complete and then you get a brand new house and with one or two apartments to rent. Which so, is a great system. Yes, also, well, no need for banks and yes, it's subsidies. It's a wise system. Yeah. Of course, it was, um, let's, say, a, a, let's say, a version of populist capitalism. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it got a lot of criticism. Oh, it did? Okay. Yes. Uh, especially Still this, to this day, right? Yes. While we were filming this documentary series, I published a short video about the history of the Polycatequia. Making videos about architectures in cities across the world has been an interesting journey, to say the least. You would think that talking about structures of glass, steel, and stone wouldn't elicit many emotions, right? But oh no, architecture has a way of pricking at our conscience, especially when talking about housing, a topic that touches upon our core feelings of home. To some, it brings a sense of familial joy. To others, it's a feeling of inadequacy for the lack of affordable housing. And to others, it brings up a burning rage to destroy the systems that rule our world. For some reason, I didn't really think that the history of these hastily planned concrete structures that swarm cities all around Greece would get much of a reaction. I mean, they are just buildings. These are the type of buildings that made Athens such a vibrant city and facilitate a massive population growth. Any neighborhood you would go to, you would see these gray concrete buildings with massive awnings. The reason it makes Athens a very vibrant city is because it facilitates both businesses, taverns, bars, hairdressers, offices, and also very ample living space. It is a great system that keeps both rich and poor living together. living what? Are you delusional? <laughs> Vibrant? I think you misspelled shit covered in mold. You are, these are terrible, overcrowded, meant to pack as many people as possible. What the hell are you talking about? Athens is the ugliest city I've ever you been. try so hard to make it look like it's a good place. Man, fuck Plus those What are you talking about? These are just ugly in the most disgusting city of Greece. Just a concrete shit. It is not a great system. It's what ruined Malacca. Fuck those buildings.
The Athenians have a point. It's a chaotic city that seems to have no plan whatsoever. Was there any zoning ever put in place? Is there any rationale behind these buildings? Professor of Architecture at the University of Thessaly, Kostis Panigidis, may help us make sense out of the seemingly senseless. The zoning and nothing is vertical. The people who live on the top of the Polykatikias, the people who live in the middle, and the people who live on the ground or even halfway down level. Yeah. So th this is very important because it, it always was like that. And the retire, which is, comes from the where to retire. Or when you have this elevation of the Polykatikia, when you go to the top, you have to go back for the upper floors. And these setbacks all had this zone of large balcony because of the setback. Probably they had the view. They were always the good apartments, the expensive apartments, the retire. The retire was always the rich. Did it work, integrating it, rich with? Poor? Yes, of course. The other was, you know, middle class. And I don't know if, if it mattered really if you were on the third or fourth floor, but if you were on the first floor or fourth, there was a difference. And then ground level, which is the shops. But also, we have a semi basement, which is a really funny word. An underground level with some uh, way to put some light in. A little lower class, uh, people who live there. But, but uh, at least in the, sta in the start of the, the onset of the Polykatikia, all these people had some kind of relation. There was this uh, Thiroros. The Thiroros was uh, the front desk, let's say, of the Polykatikia. They would also do errands and go to for cigarettes or wash the, the floor in the front. Gradually, this, of course, faded. Theory obsolete, let's say, by 1990, completely, completely obsolete, and they disappeared. And, the, and their apartments, their semi-basement uh, apartments, went to the first wave of immigrants that came. And even now, the basement level is taken up by immigrants, and then you go up and things like that. So it's still working? I consider this a good thing. I mean, it okay. still can accommodate different you know, class uh, levels. Because one, one uh, thing that is essential for the city yeah. is to have um, mixtures. I think that one thing that will be, to me, one thing that will be probably catastrophic for uh, the Linico, which is a big development, the old airport, okay. is that it will be solely very, very expensive. High income. Uh, high income. And, that's why it will not uh, be able to create any kind of uh, meaning of a sense of place. At the start, of course, some people maybe will buy. They are already buying. But, uh, but then you need to have some sense of city. Even, you know, even, even very, very high paying uh, renters want to live in a city with a sense of community. And it's also very difficult to recreate this situation with a new, with a new design, to recreate this, uh, this multiplicity. Because um, take the project in Chicago, for, for example. The projects in Chicago were called projects exactly for that reason. They were projects that uh, people from universities tried to find ways to have a large apartments with people who were, let's say, middle class. And very quickly, uh, these things were homogenized. Two weeks ago, two Chicago policemen were shot to death by snipers at a housing project. Four suspects were arrested. Mayor Daly said he would spend $3 million on security and services at the project, Cabrini Homes, but black leaders say it's typical of all that's bad about low-income public housing. It's, it's almost like walking through a, a patch in Vietnam, but we've got gang elements that are opposing each other. And consequently, people who aren't involved with either side get caught in the middle. It is like a jungle. Because we have these massive low-income housing blocks, the streets are not as safe and as calm to walk around. And then the opposite is true with high-income housing. We have these massive high-income skyscrapers, but the streets are I dead. It's called the, the, the life and death, or death and life. By Jane Jacobs, yes. And the main thing there is that you need to have space that's you know cared of by the people. So what? This uh, Polykatikia thing really achieves, and I don't really know how it, to, 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 it's recreatable in um, design. That's why their work is so important, uh, because, 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 because it's, it's an attempt to, to, to work on that, uh, you know, on that level. 
Is it due to the Greek culture? Because in Greek culture is very uh, collective, communal culture, as opposed to America or UK where it's individualistic. So people watch out for themselves, but here people tend to watch out for the community, or the family at least. I think there's also something to the urban typology. The way that the ground level is always lively. If, if you go to suburbs of Athens, they have a ground level given to cars. There's no such uh, atmosphere. Right, right. There, of course, you know, it's Greeks there also, and uh, everyone is out and shouting. And, but uh, I think there is something to this uh, typology. You know, take the people out and put other people in, and then I, I think it will work the same way. Well, but, but this is... It's a Greek experiment, in a way. <laughs> this is what I believe in architecture. I mean, I, the shell that we occupy. Yeah. It's very important that we give the, to the shell some of our characteristics to take up from that, too. So... So you think architecture has a direct impact in our lives? In our daily lives? I think, I think yes. I think uh, Athens was lucky because it was not uh, it was not even designed. It's sheer luck. Exactly, it's very organic. How does it compare to Paris? Because Paris was meticulously designed, and you have these huge housing blocks that are similar to the Polikatekias, but it's different at the same time. How do you compare both of them? It's very difficult to compare. One thing that I can tell you about Paris is that it's on a completely other level, but then Paris is also a lesson about typology. You see, you have this 19th century, very organic city that's full of risings and barricades and all these things. So they just, you know, tear down an enormous amount of building stock and create these um, boulevards, digging in, inside the city. This is a way to impose this Western, mathematical, straight line typology to the city so that, you know, cannons can go in with a straight line shot, win the city, and they did. But what Aldo Rossi says about Paris, it's exactly the same quality that makes Paris the big theater of the revolution in 1968 because of the photographic lens, the camera, and the straight quality of, you know, the image. But, but the typology itself has its own story. So what, the, 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 that's the only relation I can take. The Polygatikia has created its own story, and we, we don't know how it will continue to react. Do you think the Athenian model can be taught to other cities? Because in New York, we need a lot of housing. And what Athens in the 1950s seemed like genius. Uh, to make the system where people could work together and not necessarily have too much money to exchange, but somehow they were able to grow housing very quickly and provide a construction boom. But that's not happening in major cities around the world at the moment. Uh, I really believe in the research and design research, not necessarily replicating, you know, the form of the Polkatkia, but trying to address uh, how to, to connect the dots One thing that uh, I want to say is that you, you cannot imagine how surprising it is to have um, people admiring what we are, what is around us. Well, the gear. It is really surprising because up to let's say 30 years ago, which I remember very well, the Polkadikia was a, you know disgusting, non-designed uh, <laughs> thing that we had to... We had to... We had to, we had to we Destroy and build something new. Yeah, we build something new. So it is very surprising, and I think that it's, it's been a lesson to... Uh, to see this. I mean, this, this is a, probably one of the things that we gain through this new world of media and uh, travel. And, uh, we can really... Uh, see our city in relation to, let's say, Paris or uh, right, New right. York. And uh, so it's not all, uh, you know, the internet is not all that bad, maybe, <laughs> maybe. and, then, uh, and uh, the media and uh, things like that. It happens with every city. People in New York hated brownstones. People in Paris hated the Hausmian buildings. <laughs> but the beautiful buildings here in Athens really t will, I think, be appreciated very soon. Anyway, that's amazing. I, no, no, no. <laughs> One thing that I've learned from my travels 
is that city dwellers often have a complicated relationship with their city. It's like a torrid love affair. There are moments of infatuation swept up by the glamour of the hustle and bustle that are often contrasted with moments of despair, overwhelmed by the chaos that is millions of people attempting to coexist. That's why architecture ties us together as humans. We all live somewhere. We all interact with structures, whether we love them or hate them. I admire Costis and Nikos. Here are two men teaching others about the value of our cities, which is important in today's rapidly changing world, because it's through understanding where we can gain true appreciation. But there is more to Athens than just its history. It's a living and breathing city. And Natasa Papa is an Athenian on the mission to showcase what brings life to it. She is the publisher and editor-in-chief of the magazine Desired Landscapes. And she also hosts tours, guiding people into the maze of stoas and interior passageways through the city's center. We even got you from graphic design to talking about urbanism. They're kind of tied together, right? Because it's both... Exactly. But Athens, in a way, is chaotic. It's not really designed, per se. It is fragmentatively designed, you'd say. So somebody had a vision here, another had a vision there. Or maybe they had a vision and the other people distorted. So New York is print and Athens is cursive. Mm-hmm. You can say that. There is a style. You can say. But it's not always precisely constructed. And many parts of Athens are very spontaneous. They don't follow regulations. They just pop up in, in an illegal way, let's say. So what I also love about Athens is the reflection of this personal uh, initiative, let's say. Mm. It's kind of surreal in that sense, I say it. So if I like to have a facade like this, I'm going to make it. That's me. But how did you get into doing this as a magazine, as a publication? You know, it's an experimental project. It started because I wanted to document cities, if it means, let's say, history or if it means feelings. And I, because this is the sixth issue, I realized that it's all about uh, visuals. So what happens if you follow the map of a city? How do you feel? How do you relate to the image of the map? Do you already have a, a preconceived image of how the city is going to be and how the actual city is going to um, how can I say, it? treat you. For example, we have another piece here about Stockholm and it's all about this bird's eye view of Stockholm. So what happens if you see a city from above? Is this kind of promise that, you know, this is a city you can explore, it has landmarks, it has small alleyways, but what happens when you land in the city and you actually walk on the sidewalk? It's a different story. That's why I, I love coming to Europe as an American. I grew up luckily in New York, uh, but uh, unfortunately in many other parts of America, even just outside the city of New York, you can really no longer walk around. It's all massive cars. Usually it's the same landmarks, which would just be the McDonald's, the gasoline station. So you really don't feel like it's a place for you. It's a place for you to drive here. Yeah, that's why I chose this city because I was abroad also to study and work. But yeah, Athens gives you this, so it's a perfect scale. You can walk and you know, not get tired, see lots of things. Only the climate is a bit weird lately. Why do you think people think it's so ugly and, and a terrible place to live? This is, this is as, as someone who travels a lot to major cities, this is normal. Yeah. Most major cities. People hate their city for some reason. <laughs> yes. But why do you think that happens with Athens? I have a theory, uh, it's just a hypothesis, I don't know if this is the thing, but many people in Athens, they don't want to be in Athens. I haven't seen it in other cities that uh, prominent, you know, because they come from different places and Athens is the place that they come to work. So, you know, work is also a bad, a bad thing for us. So, you know, it's not about vacation, it's about working. So that's a, um, you know, a funny hypothesis, of course, it's not the, the reality. But you get this feeling that many people don't want to be here. They want to be abroad because abroad they can find better work opportunities. They want to be in their villages because they have nature there or they have the sea. So Athens has no nature, no sea, no nothing. But if you really open your eyes, 
You just take one big boulevard like Siglu Avenue and you go to the sale. If you want it, you can have it. And then another thing you can see is the balconies that are full of trees and plants, some of them very much, so you cannot really see the house. So this is also another way to remember like your villages or nature. Yeah. To somehow compensate that you don't like this concrete city and you want to be in a, I don't know, in a paradise place or something. I think there's an Athenian aesthetic. Has anyone defined it yet? No, but how do you see it? I mean, could you describe it? Yeah, I'm trying to, uh, trying to formulate it, but the, the close proximity of the streets, you also have a lot of these combination of the 1950s international style right next to neoclassical. And kind of that combination together to me feels Athenian. Okay, I get it. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of, if you can sum, sum up it, yeah, we have this kind of styles. Because in New York, it's separate. International style buildings tend to be like in Midtown Manhattan. The older Beaux-Arts style tend to be in Lower Manhattan. Lead the way. So we can go inside. This uh, passageway is all about printing. Same goes with this street. So if you wanted to print something, you could come here. Back in the nice days, like in the 60s, 80s, you could find 11 print shops in here. Look at this tiny, tiny shop. It's about to be faded because they used to sell these uh, typewriters, but now I see that he took some of them out. Here we have a very nice situation of somebody doing letterpress, uh, the old way of printing. Speaking of typography, do you think the Greek lettering is disappearing? Uh, no, I would say the opposite. So, I would okay, say good. that we became aware that the Greek alphabet is unique and yeah. it's our selling point and finally we can export it. Yeah. Mm, but you can smell the, the exactly. paper. Exactly. And there's even ancient parts of the building. You it's understood it? Yes. Yeah. So actually this is the old city and these were... Oh, yeah, check this out. Old part of the building right there exposed. Oh. Yeah. It's not a building, it's even worse. It's older. This is the old walls of Athens. That's the old walls of yeah. Athens. You know that uh, it raises this kind of question about preservation in a city of thousands years old. So is it common to find ancient Athenian architecture yeah. aside from the walls? Civic Everywhere, buildings? yeah. So if you make a sidewalk, maybe you're going to find something from... <laughs> So the layers are not that deep. There, there are many layers, actually. They can be like seven or five layers, and they're not that deep, no. Do you want to see the roof yeah. by any chance? Oh, it's been a while I've been here. True urban exploration right over here. Sneaking into the rooftops. Wow. Isn't it perfect? Oh, this is a cool view. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Look I knew this. that you will get this. Yeah. I did, not, I did not think I would get a view like this. So that's what I value, you know, you know these the neglected spaces of Athens. Yeah, for some reason, I don't know, I, I'm sure I'm not the only weird one. I so, love this, yeah. yeah I, I love yeah. spaces like these. A lot of people tend to think that the built environment is something bad yeah. for humanity. Yeah. But no, this is, our, this is a natural expression. It looks exactly. like a huge ant mound or a yeah. beaver dam. This is nature right here. Yeah, this is our nature. In our society, we tend to see architecture as an artifice that erases our natural landscape. A mere four walls and a ceiling which shelters us from the elements while we sleep, eat, and work. But our buildings are nature because they are built by the predominant species of our planet, us humans. One night many years ago, I was on the airplane looking at the window towards the cities down below. And as I saw the twinkling streetlights, I had a realization. Our cities emulate nature. The streets stretch out in countless directions like tree branches growing during springtime. Skyscrapers are huddled together like a forested area amongst the meadow. And planes are flying overhead, 
transporting passengers to other cities, like bees buzzing by to pollinate another flower. Perhaps one day our built world will be indistinguishable from our natural world. So, since Athens is getting so densely populated, are people trying to find new uses for these buildings? Not really. Not really. <laughs> you know, oh, because it's still sprawling. How much? I mean, it, there's okay. limits. There are limits. We haven't reached them yet, but still. Um, it can't become like LA. Because it is it's still spread. The, the but mountains. yeah, we have the five mountains around us. That's the one thing. I think this is covered actually. Yeah, I think the mountains is covered. Mm. And then you don't feel Athens. Like the place you go today is not Athens. It's mm. beyond the mountains, let's say. Mm. I think the only solution to solve this kind of empty building problem is the Airbnb issue. <laughs> so um, if, let's say, my family owns an apartment, now they're more keen to actually rent it yeah. because they see the profit. Before that, they were like, it's better to be empty because it's ours, it's super good, nobody has to destroy it, but if we put people inside, they're going to destroy it. Mm -hmm. That's the mental uh, thing here. <laughs> so with Airbnb, they became more open to rent their places. But, you know, it became the other edge, like making super luxury apartments out of this yes. kind of building. It uh, happens in New York City as well. Exactly. Yeah. No connection with the residents. And if you see on the top, you see this garden. So this is a small loft and it's actually something like a guest house. So this person doesn't live here, but when people from abroad, they visit, he hands the keys. Oh, so that's yeah. an Airbnb. It's, it's not actually Airbnb, it's about his friends. I gotta, I gotta make friends with that guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it sounds like a, it looks yeah. like a good view. Yeah, the view is amazing, but I don't want to hear about the heat there. It should be <laughs> crazy. Natasa continued taking us through the often unseen interior of Athens city center, through passageways that are gateways to the past of Greece's post-war booming economy. Neon signs collecting dust, small shops hanging by the last threads of their dying clientele and basements once teeming with life, now abandoned. Booms and busts have become the normal rhythm of this city. Athens has become such a hive of polikatekias that has me wondering, what will be the future of living in Athens? I was actually thinking whether the Polikatekia can be brought into the 21st century. And then I found out that Maria, who's actually filming this documentary, along with her colleague, Katerina, have come up with a very interesting solution because they're both architects. Meet Maria Epida Queridu. She's the cinematographer and editor of this documentary series. And Katerina Kaku, our illustrator and assistant editor. Both actually studied architecture with Professor Costis Panigiris. And for the thesis of their master's diploma, they envisioned the future of the Polikatekia, which they named Porosity. Drawing from the elements that originally worked, such as wide terraces, the closeness of balconies, and mixed use so there can be shops, cafes, bars, restaurants in the lower levels. And improving on the aspects that the typical Polikatekias lacked, such as greenery on the terraces, spaces for relaxation, and opening up each level to more light and air. It's innovators like Maria, Caterina, and the many other locals we've met on this journey that breathe life into Athens. Every corner of the city is teeming with a creative spirit. But now that we've learned how Athens grew to become the metropolis it is today, how will Athens change? And will it be for the better or for the worse? No, no, no. We are going now to the neoclassical buildings on the Relay District mm -hmm. together. They prepare it to you. Now it's very quiet. You can hear in the afternoon. It's chai, samosa, beetle nuts, all together. And now you can see here the beetle nuts. What is the neighborhood of, uh, what's the name of this neighborhood? We're still in Omonia. Mm. 
That is where most of the justification starts in the border. Mm. You see the day there, living there, people using drugs, and now the mayor brought back the 60s design. So now the, it looks like it used to look in the 60s. It's part of this uh, gentrification process. Okay. Two, three years ago, these Israeli investors found the potential of this part of town. They say, you look at the map, it's very good location. And it's very, very cheap. It's the cheapest real estate of the city. These uh, investors think this is ideal for gentrification. They are pioneering in gentrification. But uh, tourists don't know because they look at a map and the location looks great. Yeah. So that's how gentrification works through tourists. This, this is one of the 20 mm -hmm. investments in Greece. This is did. And uh, next time you come, this is going to be a boutique hotel. Hey everyone, Ariel here. This episode is the reason why I made the Athens Urbanist documentary series in the first place. Thank you, thank you so much for watching episode three out of six episodes. If you want to go on a real life Greek adventure, you can book yourself an official urbanist multi-day trip through Greece. Go to tours.urbanist.live. Stay tuned for the next episode because we're going to learn about one of the most tumultuous moments in recent Athenian history. Stay curious, my friends.